Hey, one of the fun things uh, for us with our kids growing up was uh, seeing how our kids distinguish between their grandparents. Uh, and uh, Pierre, when he was, I don't know, three, four years old, would talk about um, the white grandma and the brown grandpa. <laughs> um, and also the brown grandma and the white grandpa. Those were the two sets. Um, that was the way he initially distinguished between them, and that's obviously got to do with complexion. Uh, another way was uh, the baddies. One of the sets of grandparents were called the baddies. <laughs> and and uh, I don't have the photo. I don't have the photo. It's okay. They don't know which grandparents, my love. I don't know whose parents I'm talking about. But um, it was because we had a photo on our wall with hats. They had the hats on, and they looked like baddies. I don't know why. But uh, another way uh, was to talk about the parents with the mansion. The parents with the mansion, which those are Suzanne's parents. Let me just say that. It is a bed and breakfast. They have a guest house, and so they had like 10 rooms that um, they put guests in. So it's. There you go. This is the mentality of a four year old, Jane. <laughs> Um, anyway, that, the, 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 the thing with Son's parents is they have this guest house, they um, do have a and b and so often when we're on holiday, they would uh, have events on, because they don't take holiday when we do, uh, so we would be there, we would spend time with them, and there'd be a wedding at the guest house, or there'd be uh, someone's 50th birthday, and, and things like that, and we would jump in and help, we'd help prepare food, Suzanne would often be behind the bar, um, and serve soft, soft drinks only, as you do, um, because that's what you do for family, right? There's a family business, um, and some things you do for family. Even though you're on holiday, you go the extra mile, and, um, and you jump in, and you, and you give more. You give more than you would have, because it's family. It's the family business. Um, and this is true, obviously, for blood family, but how much more for spiritual family? Um, that we go the extra mile for spiritual family, that we jump in to the family business. And this spiritual family of ours really does have a family business. Um, we all know that God is revealed through the Bible uh, and by Jesus as Father, and that you and I, we are not just minions, um, but we are sons and daughters of, of the Most High God. We are a part of His family, spiritual family. Many metaphors in the Bible for the church, for the people of God, but certainly one of those is family. God is Father. We are sons and daughters. And that this family, just like Suzanne's parents and her family has a family business, this family also has a family business. The spiritual family of God is in the business of being in relationship with people, of, of a father who wants to find and be in relationship with lost sons and daughters. This is the heart of God. This is what he really is about. This is what um, the business that we are excited about when we think every nation card, if when we think what God has called us to, to be a part of is, is not just to come here and, you know, put up speakers and make coffee and have kids in a room and do church services, but really uh, to help grow the family of God, to help lost sons and daughters come into relationship with a loving Father. This is our dream, right? Every Nation Cardiff, this is, this is our heartbeat. It's, it's not just to do stuff and have programs, but really to see more people experience the love of God, more people come into relationship with Him. Um, and this family business um, of God needs to be funded somehow. Funding the family business is what I am going to talk about today. There's a long introduction to butter you guys up because, friends, my conviction, my, guys, my, my absolute persuasion is that God loves the local church and that God uses the local church, that Jesus gave himself uh, for the local church, that he gave his body, he gave, he, he, he gave himself for his church. 
And, and sometimes we hear people saying negative things about the church, and we've got to be very careful because Jesus loves his bride. There's another metaphor for the people of God, the church. Um, and the scripture says, Ephesians 3 talks about the manifold, the multifaceted wisdom of God that radiates and emanates from the church, that the gospel is being made known from the church, and that God loves to use his church, uh, his local church, all around Cardiff, and us, every nation Cardiff, to make his good news and to make his gospel known to the world, Um, and that there's something powerful of us giving ourselves to the church and giving to the church. And so what I'd like to do today is to talk about Uh, funding the family business a little bit, Uh, and and particularly um, as a point of reference for us as we start this journey. I mean, we started this journey a long time ago, but how do we give? Why do we give? You know, Suzanne spoke about that earlier, says, no, there's some videos on our website, everynationcardiff.org, about getting a revelation on giving. But these sorts of things are important. Um, And sometimes we think, do we have to talk about money? Um, But the truth is that Jesus spoke a lot about money. We we know the scripture speaks a lot about money. I love to speak about money because I know the blessing of of understanding giving and living out giving um, and being a part of what God is doing in the world, not just through my service, not just through my time, but also through my finances. Uh, And as as I set this up, I just want to position myself here not to put a focus on us as a family, but just to be open and honest with you guys that Suzanne and I, as a family, we give radically to this church because, number one, we believe in the vision that God has called this church to. Uh, We love the fact that the money that we give here at Every Nation Cardiff actually goes to places all around the world, Um, but also because we understand the blessing of giving. And I know for the most part, we get this, right? But just because we get it doesn't mean we don't talk about it. In the same way that we all know about Coca-Cola, they still advertise, right? Um, because we need to keep these things at the front of our minds. So I want to talk about funding the family business, something I'm very passionate about. Um, and we're going to look at a powerful portion of Scripture in Mark chapter 12. So if you have a Bible here or you have a phone here, you can turn to Mark chapter 12. Um, I really believe that understanding giving will liberate us. Most of the world is focused on gathering rather than giving. And gathering will enslave us. It does enslave us. We know that you can, there's never enough. Yesterday at Etienne's birthday party, I spoke to a father, um, very interesting guy, who has a Catholic grandmother on the one side and a Muslim grandmother on the other side uh, and a Jewish uncle in the mix there. Um, and, And he said, you know, he's just, He's done with the better job, the bigger house, the faster car. It just doesn't, hasn't brought what he thought it would. As he gets older, more and more he realizes that. And this gathering mentality ultimately will keep us in a cycle of slavery. But giving, understanding giving will liberate us. Amen. And we're going to read here from Mark chapter 12, verse 41 to 44. It talks about uh, Jesus. And he and Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums, and the poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make about a penny. They say 64th of a day's wage. Okay, so that helps us a little bit. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. And if you first read that, you're like, Jesus, are you... Not that great at maths. How can she put in more money when she's clearly put in less money? But Jesus is talking about sacrifice here. He's talking about a cost. He's talking about taking a risk in terms of giving. And he says that for all these people, for that woman, it cost the most. What she gave 
cost more than any of the other people. And really, this is the one thing I want to say to us today is funding the family business should heart, not hurt. Funding the family business should heart, should come from a place of the heart and, and not just hurt. Um, here's, a, here's a truth for us. Godly funding is radical and it can hurt. If the kind of funding that we see here with this woman, that can hurt, right? I mean, she's given everything she has. She has very little, yet she brings it to the offering box, and that could potentially hurt so much. Here's a little passage about uh, David. Ornan said to David, take it and let my Lord the king do what seems good to him. See, I give the oxen for burnt offerings and the threshing sledges for the wood and the wheat for a grain offering. I give it all. But King David said to Ornan, no, but I will buy them for the full price. I will not take for the Lord what is yours, nor offer burnt offerings that cost me nothing. So David paid Ornan 600 shekels of gold by weight for the site. Okay, we see a little glimpse there of a cost where King David, this king of Israel, says, no, no, he will not give something to God that doesn't really cost him anything. He wants to pay the full price. He wants to make sure that it costs him something. And this is, if we're just being real here, which I hope we can be, is sometimes giving really hurts. Like we know it's good. We know there's a blessing in it, but it's also tough. It's difficult. If, if I look at my accounts, at our balance sheet, okay, at our budget, which Suzanne and I look at together often, um, there are some giving amounts there that would go nicely elsewhere. A and prioritizing those can be like, oof, are we, are we still sure about this? Because, <laughs> you know, we could easily just shift things around a bit, and that would make things a bit easier. But there's something there that hurts. Um, and when we start to think radical giving, which we'll talk about more in, in a moment, we see what this widow gives, we see what King David gives, it can really hurt. I remember years ago in, in 2016, I believe, when we had the GO conference in Florida, uh, I think it was 2016, we planned to go on a family holiday and take the kids to Disney because every nation, every three years, they have a world conference somewhere, and most recently in Cape Town. This time it was in Orlando. We thought, that's a great opportunity. I'm going to go anyway. Why don't we go as a family, and we can take the kids for a couple of days to Disney. It sounds awesome. At the same time, we had friends of ours whose business went bust at that time. They had two young kids, um, and they were really struggling. And so Suzanne and I were praying about whether or not we should try and help them. And uh, spoke to the kids about, decided we'll talk to our kids about it and tell them, well, this is what we're thinking. This is what we're praying about. The reality is if we do help these guys, we won't go to Orlando um, because we have to prioritize one thing over the other. And I'll never forget that our middle child, Pierre, said, give them the money. It's okay if we don't go. We can always go one day, another time, but rather give these people the money. And it just broke my heart. Talk about hurting and hurting. I mean, it's just the, the generosity, the sacrifice, the cost. I mean, him and his young mind, considering all of this, it was so beautiful to me. Um, and, and it ended up that, um, for various reasons, they actually had another way to get out of their difficult situation, those friends of ours. We ended up not giving them the money, um, and we ended up going to Disney, which is just the grace of God, certainly for our children, because what a great time they had. But the picture I'm trying to paint, paint for us here is when we think of the godly kind of giving, it can hurt. And if we look at God the Father, who gave his absolute best, right? He gave his son. Someone said that he bankrupted heaven by giving Jesus for us that we might be in relationship with him. This is what we're talking about. Um, is that the family business of God is to draw people close to himself. And be, he gave his best. He gave something that cost him. God the Father gave something that cost so much that 
We can only imagine that that must have hurt. So godly funding is radical, and it can hurt. But godly funding is right from the heart. It should really come from a place of the heart. Just like Pierre in that moment uh, wanted to give these guys something that would cost him so much is because he, he was moved by compassion, right? He was moved by, and King David, he was moved. He loved God. He wanted to give God something from his heart, not just something that was easy. This, this widow in the story, I don't know, but I can only imagine that she somehow had an encounter with Jesus, the, the Bible doesn't say, but I can only imagine that she heard him teaching or she saw him healing someone. Something in her heart was moved to be able to trust God to give as radically as she did. We, we can only assume. But we know that God the Father gave his best because he loved us. It's from his heart. Scripture says, John three sixteen, one of the most quoted, one of the most well-known, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever ever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God's greatest gift that was so radical and probably hurt was from a place of love because of his heart, right, right from the heart. And so we've got to get this, that, that godly funding, funding the family business, it, yes, it can hurt, but it should really hurt. It should come from the heart. And that radical sacrifice, the cost of giving, is, is okay when it comes from our hearts. We, we're somehow empowered to do it. If we will allow our hearts to be shaped. If we will open up our hearts. If we think about this, do you remember what God has given you? Do you remember how he has saved you? and changed your life? Do you remember how he has impacted your relationships, maybe your family? What he has given us is so much, right? And do we want others to experience that as well? Because when we allow our hearts to be shaped like that, and we want others to experience the same as what we've experienced, then that godly funding comes from a place of our hearts. So I want to get real practical here, and this for us here at Every Nation Cardiff really are principles that I hope that we can give by, not just now, but for the next hundred years. And this is something that is so personal to me, but it's such a strong conviction. When we think, how do we give? What are some of the principles of giving that I believe are godly, I believe are biblical, and I believe are practical to help us? Uh, number one, we give out of revelation. Like I said, Giving, godly funding is from the heart. It's from a place of having experienced God's kindness. And uh, revelation is just a fancy word for understanding. We understand why we give. If you are a giving person right now and you don't know why, um, then you have our permission to stop. Okay, stop giving until you understand why. What is the point of giving? Where does it come from? What is the heart of giving? It should be from a place of revelation. Um, I'm going to read just a couple of verses from the letters of Paul to the Corinthian church because he talks a lot about giving with them. This is in 2 Corinthians 9, <clears throat> and Paul says the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Say not under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful, a joyful giver. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. I mean, what a sentence. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. The first revelation that we must have about giving is that God is the great giver. We don't give so that we can receive. We give because we have received. God has supplied the seed for sowing. This is such an important revelation for us to have. 
And so often, you know, you see all the weird sort of teachings and stuff, and we have access to it all the time these days on YouTube. You can watch anyone preach anything. And, and so often this thing comes out of, if you want to be blessed, then give. If you want to receive, then give. And so there's a motivation in our giving to receive. And it's completely backwards. It's getting the cart before the horse. We give as a response because God has given us everything. He has supplied all that we need. He's supplied for our needs abundantly. The scripture says that we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so this is, for me, almost a non-negotiable in our giving, is our giving is a response. I have received, and so I give. This is the same thing as in, in the family business, right? When, when I help Suzanne's dad prepare food for an event or Suzanne helps behind the bar, it's not so that they can be a part of the family or we can be a part of the family. It's because we are a part of the family that we give and we help and we serve. And in the same way, our giving is always from a place of having received. A second revelation, and there's so many that we must have about giving, but I'll just talk about these two very briefly, is when we give, it is the gift that keeps on giving. Okay? We don't give so that we receive, but when we give, we do receive as well. It's an incredible thing. It's, for instance, I, we give our kids pocket money. Every week they get money into their rooster card, okay? And, and that's the money that we, they ask us for something. I said, well, you've got money in your rooster card, right? Do you? <laughs> then go for it. Spend it. You know, that's yours to spend. Now, they get that money irrespective. They don't have to do chores to get that money. Now, there are different systems. I know people do it differently. No condemnation if your kids have to do chores, okay, for their pocket money. But that's what they get as a standard every week. Now, if Leah Jean were to take some of the money that she gets every week and she were to invest that into something, that would build little dividends and in the end give more money, a greater return than what she put in, then she would get from two sources, if that makes sense. She gets the money that we give her anyway, but that money that she gives or invests keeps on giving. And in the same way, we have to understand that God blesses us. He gives to us, and we give as a response because we have received. But when we give into God's kingdom, it's like investing that will bring a return as well. Uh, and that's why the scripture says, whoever sows sparingly, reaps sparingly, gives bountifully, because the principle of sowing and reaping is a godly principle put into the earth. And there is something about, about putting, our, putting our money where our mouths are that just releases even a greater harvest than what we've experienced already. So that's powerful. Talk about giving out of revelation, giving from understanding, the first thing that we must no, and that I believe this widow knew when she gave into the offering box is that we give from a place of having received. We don't give to receive, but when we give, we also <laughs> receive on that giving. The second thing I want to say is that we do give radically. Okay, the principles, we have three principles. The first one is revelation. The second one is radically, and we give radically by God's grace. Paul wrote this uh, uh, to the Corinthians as well, and I love this. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace, say grace, grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. In severe taste of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. part. Have you ever seen? Test, severe test of affliction and abundance of joy in the same sentence, uh, and extreme poverty and wealth of generosity. And the key word there is grace. It is the grace of God that enables them to have joy in affliction and generosity in poverty. And so when we give, it's radically by God's grace. It empowers us. It enables us. This Macedonian church, when Paul writes to the Corinthians, um, in that next passage, the next chapter, he says, I don't want you to be embarrassed, you know, when you consider the Macedonian church and how they give because of the grace of God and the way that they give, and he encourages them to give the same. So 
when we give, we give radically, but we do so by the grace of God. The grace of God enables us, empowers us. It's not our, we don't muster it up. Ooh, how much can I give? It's the grace of God that enables us to do that. And the final principle, the final R um, that I think is so important for us is to give regularly, regularly by faith. Because sometimes it's easier than other times. Sometimes we feel like it, sometimes we don't. But by faith, we do it regularly. 1 Corinthians 16, Paul says, Concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. I don't think that every week is the important part. It's as you may prosper. As we receive, we set something aside to give. And this is a a regular thing that we do as we pray regularly, as we worship regularly, as we gather and fellowship regularly. This is something as we prosper, we set something aside regularly. Whether we feel like it or not, we do it by faith. I think these three things, I mean, they've guided, they've helped me personally so much to understand it's out of revelation, understand it is radical, but by the grace of God, and it is regular by faith. And if I use that as a, as a starting point, that really helps me in my giving, in my giving. I'll touch on the tithe just very quickly here, and we don't have too much time uh, for this, but some people have a revelation of giving 10% of their income, okay? And they do that from a place of revelation. And if that's you, that's great, you know? Don't... Uh, there's such, there is a little bit of debate on, and look, there's a lot of debate on this, and, and I don't want to get into it necessarily. What I do want to say is, sorry, Mike, um, some say it's Old Testament, it's law, some say it's not, it's upheld by Jesus, he spoke to the Pharisees, you should tithe, but you should also do the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy, and, and there's this uh, bit of a mystery there, but the fact of the matter is, the New Testament is always greater than the Old, okay? The New Covenant, we are empowered by grace to do even more than we did before. Okay, in the Old, it said don't murder, but Jesus said in the New, if you look at someone ang with anger, you've already committed murder in your heart. So the bar is even higher under the New Covenant, but by the grace of God. So however you see tithing and your revelation of it, let me just say, let us be people that give from a place of understanding, understanding that we have received, and so we give as a response, okay? Understanding that when we give, it's like seed in the ground that will produce a harvest. We understand that we can give radically, like this widow who gave her whole livelihood. But we do so by the grace of God, just like the Macedonian church. And we give regularly by faith. A few last fun thoughts here just as we come to an end. Some practical wisdom on giving. So we've spoken about principles. For me, the three R's are really strong principles, but here's some practical uh, wisdom. Grow in uh, understanding. Grow in revelation. So we also have those. I, I, I talk about this in more detail. I do talk about tithing in a lot more detail on those videos on YouTube. If you go to our website and you click on the giving section, you'll see some videos there. If you're like, I still don't get it, do, make an effort to try and get it and, and do some research whether it's through videos, our videos, or other videos on YouTube, or just your own study in the Scripture. Grow in understanding, the understanding of giving. Give to the church. Okay. I had such a strong passion on this long before I was a church leader. Okay, now I know people distrust church leaders when they say, give to the church. I get it. But my conviction for many, for long before I stood here with this microphone, is that God uses the local church and the gospel emanates, radiates, the multifaceted wisdom of God radiates from the church. And, and so it's a powerful place uh, to invest. Don't audit the church. Just so you know, this church is audited, by the way. Okay. <laughs> it's audited every year. Um, and our accounts are publicized every year. So if you really want to, you could. But for me, and this has been my conviction, again, while I was a person just 
attending church and being a member and serving and giving long before I led a church. I was like, I'm, I'm not, it's not my place to audit. I'm going to give to the church. I'm going to trust Jesus, and I'm going to trust the church. If you don't trust the church, find another one. That's the easiest answer. If you're like skeptical about what they're doing with my money, I'm sure there's another church <laughs> that would be okay. But or just find out more. You know, like I said, you can, we our accounts are publicized. You can find out where does the money go. I don't think that that's helpful. If you're always worrying about where every penny goes, just trust Jesus. Trust the church. If you don't trust the church, maybe find another one. I say that uh, facetiously a little bit, but also not. Um, and then just start, you know, just start giving somewhere. Like this, this widow, okay, it cost her a lot, but it was a little. And if we haven't experienced the joy of giving, if we don't, if we haven't understood that funding the family business is from the heart, um, then start somewhere and see how faithful God is in the midst of that. I've said this here before that we have a money back guarantee on our giving. And that's 100% serious. If you give in this church and you feel worse off, we will give your money back. Because I'm totally convinced that it's a blessing. It's more blessed to give than to receive. And when we give, we experience that incredible blessing of God's giving, of, God's, of God giving to us first and us giving as a response. Amen. I want to say, any, any questions, but... Um, if you do have questions about this and you do struggle with this, please do speak to me. I'd love to have a conversation with you about this. Um, I just think this is one of the greatest privileges of following Jesus is to be able to give generously, to give cheerfully, not under compulsion, but with joy from the heart. Our response today is to receive God's great gift again. You know, we sang so much about Jesus, but Jesus is the one that enables all of this in us. And because God gave Jesus, we have access to all these things. Open up your heart and fund the family business. Give, give generously. Think about revelation. Think about radical by grace and regular by faith. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you so much just that we can gather together. Thank you, Father, that we can talk about this great discipline of giving. Thank you for the blessing that is in it, God. Father, I want to thank you for everyone that has given so generously to this church, Father. Thank you that you bless them, Father, that your blessing rests on them. Father, I thank you that you challenge us even um, as we consider giving radically and being a part of your great mission in the earth. Will you lead us? Will you speak to us, Holy Spirit? Help us to be cheerful givers, not to give under compulsion, but from a place of understanding. Father, we also pray for every need represented in this room. Father, especially, especially physical needs. When we think of the cost of living crisis, Father, we think of bills to pay. We think of heating in the winter time. We think of all these things that are so expensive. God, will you bring radical breakthrough in your provision towards us. We trust you for it. We acknowledge that you are the great provider, that you are faithful in every sense, in every way you are faithful towards us. And we bless you, God, for what you've done in the past and what you will do in the future. And God, I pray for a financial blessing, Father, for a, a radical provision for each of us by your Spirit. In Jesus' name. Father, we pray uh, for this campus. Lord, we pray for the students. We pray for the uh, faculty, Father, for the academics. Father, we pray your blessing upon them. Father, we pray that their hearts will be open to you, to your good news, especially at this Christmas time. Father, may you speak and may you whisper into hearts here on, on this ground, we pray, and use us as a people, as a church, uh, to help connect them with a loving Father. In Jesus' name we pray.